Good afternoon. Welcome. I'd like to uh, call the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce and U.S. Postal Service and Labor Policy um, to order. Today's hearing is on the Federal Employees Compensation Act, a fair approach. Before we begin, I will um, uh, state the Oversight Committee mission statement, as we have done in the full committee and all subcommittees. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and to bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Reform Committee. I will now move into my opening statement. The Federal Employees' Compensation Act, FECA, provides workers' compensation coverage to roughly 3 million Federal civilian workers who suffer occupational injury or disease, including those in the U.S. Postal Service. In fiscal year 2010, the cost was $2.86 billion to approximately 251,000 claimants. Of that dollar amount, nearly half or $1.1 billion went to U.S. Postal employees. FECA was last significantly amended in 1974. Today this committee will hear from a panel of witnesses who will discuss whether FECA continues to adequately provide workers' compensation to Federal employees who have suffered workforce-related injuries. Members of this committee recognize that FECA is an important program that was intended to provide income to employees while they recuperate prior to returning to work. Federal employees who have been injured while performing their duties should be compensated fairly. Under FECA, Compensation benefits are paid at a rate as high as 75 percent of salary, tax-free, for as long as the work-related injury continues or until death. Because FECA benefits typically exceed Federal retirement benefits, there exists a large incentive for Federal workers to remain on FECA beyond the point when they otherwise would have returned to work or retired. The result is that FECA has become a retirement plan for thousands of government employees because the payout is better. FECA pays monthly benefits to about 49,000 Federal employees who are on its, quote, periodic roll. Today, 14,500 Federal civilian employees continue to collect workers' compensation after their retirement age. Of the 15,470 postal employees receiving FECA benefits, 8,632 are age 55 and older, including 2,051 ages 70 and older and 132 ages 90 and older. FECA was never intended to be a retirement plan. Workers who have been permanently disabled by their injuries and who will never return to work should not be covered indefinitely by FECA. They should receive a retirement annuity as other Federal workers do. According to a 2005 audit by the Office of Inspector General for the Veterans Administration, converting retirement eligible postal and Federal employees on workers' compensation to the Federal employee retirement system when they reach retirement age will save taxpayers $500 million annually. Congress has an obligation to consider policy reforms that overhaul Federal workers' compensation to reduce costs system-wide. It is my hope we can reach bipartisan agreement on an equitable approach. I thank the witnesses for appearing today, and I look forward to their testimony. I will now recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Lynch, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses uh, for helping the committee with its work. I appreciate the Chairman holding this afternoon's hearing, as it will afford us the opportunity to examine the Federal Employees' Compensation Act, which, as the Chairman has pointed out, has not been revisited or significantly updated in over 30 years. The Federal Employees' Compensation Act, or FECA, and I will try to avoid using acronyms, uh, as it is so commonly referred to, serves as the safety net for thousands of Federal workers that are injured while in the performance of their official duties. Uh, the Federal Employees Compensation Act benefits are also extended to Federal civilian employees that may contract occupational diseases or illnesses as a result of their work environment. Today's hearing serves as a reminder that the Federal Government takes its responsibilities as an employer very seriously and is committed to having in place effective systems and policies that protect and assist the men and women of this great nation who have dedicated their professional career to public service. The Federal Workers' Compensation Program helps shield our employees and their families from undue hardships, often during times when they may be dealing with some challenging situations and circumstances. Wage loss payments ensure that these employees can continue to make ends meet, while medical reimbursement and vocational rehabilitation regularly mean 
the successful recovery and eventual return to work of these dedicated public servants. Although the Federal Workers' Compensation Program may commonly be lauded as, as a prime example of employee disability insurance, the program is not without its share of problems, especially given the fact that it has not been uh, significantly reviewed in the past 30 years. For example, time and again we hear of how injured employees face delays in the processing of paperwork, they confront stringent time limits and encounter various difficulties when they are seeking to change their physician or medical provider. On the other hand, we see employees of the Office of Worker Compensation Program having to deal with over 100,000 new claims a year, uh, and they interact with a myriad of different Federal agencies and grapple with the case management expectations and efficiencies all in the face of recent budgetary cuts. Further, with tens of thousands of Federal employees currently serving overseas in zones of armed conflict, it is even more important now that we ensure the seamless medical care and efficient processing of workers' compensation claims upon the return of these employees, who, unlike their military counterparts, often lack an established medical rehab framework or agency personnel that are dedicated to helping them navigate bureaucratic hurdles associated with filing claims for Federal workers' compensation benefits. To that end, I look forward to today's proceedings to further the dialogue on how best to update, modernize, and improve the administration of the Federal Employees' Compensation Act with the goal of making it more equitable for our employees and more manageable for our agencies. While I recognize that the various FECA-regulated uh, reform proposals that have already been put, up, uh, put forth this Congress attempt to accomplish this goal, I am less than confident that any of these proposals actually represents a truly fair approach to enhancing the Federal Workers' Compensation Program going forward, as contemplated by the title of today's hearing. Mr. Chairman, I would also like to ask unanimous consent that the statement of the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association be included in the record. And again, I thank our, our witnesses for appearing here before this subcommittee this afternoon and for helping us sort out what options may need to be considered to guarantee that injured Federal employees and their family members are receiving the proper support and treatment they deserve from a grateful nation. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. And without objection, we will show the report entered into the record. Um, members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We will now welcome our panel of witnesses. Mr. Gary Steinberg is the Acting Director of the Office of Workers' Compensation Programs at the U.S. Department of Labor. Mr. Douglas Fitzgerald is the Director, Division of Federal Employees' Compensation at the U.S. Department of Labor. Unfortunately, David Williams, the Inspector General of the United States Postal Service, could not be with us today due to illness. However, Mr. Bill Seamer, the Assistant Inspector General for Investigation, is here in his place. We have uh, next Ms. Lisa McManus is the President of CCS Holdings LP. And we have another witness who is not with us yet, uh, Ms. Rod Milargo Rodriguez, an Occupational Health and Safety Specialist with the American Federation of Government Employees. What I would like to do, in pursuant to committee rules, is ask you to uh, stand, raise your right hand, and I will swear you in before you testify. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. Uh, in order to allow time for discussion, we are going to ask you to keep your marks, remarks brief. Your written statements, of course, have been submitted and are part of the record of this hearing. Um, at this time, I will now um, uh, recognize Mr. Steinberg uh, for an opening. Thank you, Chairman Ross and committee members. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss the Federal Employees' Compensation Act with you today. On behalf of Secretary Solis, I would like to share a set of balanced proposals that would enhance the ability for us to assist beneficiaries in returning to work, provide a more equitable array of benefits, and generally modernize the program. Almost 95 years ago, Congress enacted FECA to provide workers' compensation coverage to all Federal employees and their survivors for disability and death due to work-related injuries and illnesses. The faces of FECA include the postal worker who is hurt when his mail truck is hit while driving and delivering the mail, the FBI agent who is injured or killed in the line of duty, and the VA nurse who hurts her back while lifting a patient. DOL's Office of Workers' Compensation Programs works hard to administer the program fairly, objectively, and efficiently. We seek to continuously improve the quality and service delivery to our customers, enhance internal and external communications, and reduce the cost to the taxpayer. We have made major strides in disability management, 
resulting in significant reductions in the average number of work days lost from the most serious injuries. Over the last 10 years, the average number of days lost due to serious injuries has declined by over 20 percent, producing an annual savings of $53 million. Our administration costs are only 5 percent of the total program costs, far below the average of all State self-insurance programs, which is over 11 percent. To further improve FECA, we have made comprehensive recommendations to Congress. I wish to highlight some of the major changes now. To help injured employees return to work, we request the authority to start vocational rehabilitation activities without waiting until an, in an injury is deemed to be permanent in nature. We seek a mandate to develop a return to work plan with claimants early in the rehabilitation process, and the authority to develop an assisted reemployment program with Federal agencies similar to the one that we have successfully implemented with the private sector. The proposed changes will also have a positive impact on the government's ability to achieve the President's executive order on hiring individuals with disabilities. We also suggest changes to the benefit structure. For example, the payment of schedule awards for a loss or loss of use of a limb when sight or hearing is often complicated and thus often delayed. Although not intended to replace economic loss, payments are based on the employee's salary. So a letter carrier's knee impairment is compensated at less than half the rate of her GS-15 manager with the same injury. We think these awards should be paid by DOL concurrently with wage loss compensation more rapidly, and to be fair, they should be calculated at a uniform level for all employees. We also recommend increases to burial benefits and benefits for facial disfigurements. Under current law, the majority of injured workers receive wage replacement at 75 percent of their salary, tax-free, and COLID. This rate is higher than the take-home pay for most Federal employees and at times can be an obstacle to the Department's effort to encourage every worker to make the hard and sometimes painful effort to overcome their injuries and return to work. We therefore recommend, sh recommend shifting the benefit level for the majority of claimants to 70 percent rather than 75 percent. To provide equity with other Federal employees, we also recommend establishing a lower conversion rate for, benefit, for beneficiaries beyond retirement age. This would more, more closely mirror OPM's retirement rates. Both changes would be prospective. In addition, elements of the statute need to be simplified so that we can, pro so we can process more expeditiously. For example, the current statute increases the compensation rate with anyone, for anyone with a dependent to beyond the standard 66 and two-thirds wage rate loss to 75 percent. Paying all non-retirement age beneficiaries at 70 percent would simplify the process by eliminating the continuing need to obtain and validate documentation regarding dependent eligibility. A single rate would be simpler, more equitable, and would produce a significant savings to the taxpayer. This change alone would yield a 10-year savings of over $500 million. My, my written testimony outlines other important provisions that would streamline and improve the program. In summary, FECA is a model workers' compensation program, yet it has limitations that need to be addressed. We all recognize that. The reforms we suggest today are not new. They have been proposed by both the current and previous administrations. They are careful. They are balanced. We believe they reflect good government and they will bring the program into the 21st century. Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss the program with you today. I will be prepared to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will move on to Mr. Seymour for five minutes. You are recognized. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Lynch and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss workers' compensation issues and reform. The Federal Employees' Compensation Act, or FECA, requires Federal agencies to participate in the Department of Labor's FECA program. Department of Labor bills each agency annually for compensation paid, and non-appropriated agencies also must pay Department of Labor an annual administrative fee. Eligible disabled employees receive 66 and two-thirds percent, or 75 percent with dependents, of their basic salary tax-free, plus medical-related expenses. Also, FECA places no age limit on receiving benefits. This is substantially more than other employees receive when they retire. Though unintended, FECA has become a lucrative retirement plan. The Postal Service is the largest FECA participant, paying more than $1 billion in benefits and $60 million in administrative fees annually, creating a long-term liability of $12.6 billion. As of February 2011, the Postal Service had about 15,800 disabled employees. Over 8,700 were at least age 55, about 3,100 were at least age 65, 
and about 900 were between age 80 and 98. Certain aspects of the program make it susceptible to fraud, including the claimant's ability to change their story until their claim qualifies, the claimant's ability to hire a physician rather than use a planned physician to assess their injuries and conditions, the program incentivizes DOL to collect larger fees if they approve more claims and lose budget dollars if they deny them, the lack of effective DOL case management, and employers not being allowed to present or respond to evidence at hearings. The Department of Labor has some fraud detection responsibility, but it is unclear to what extent. They advise agencies to actively manage their own programs while still charging administrative fees. There is not a clear delineation of responsibility between agency program managers and their OIGs and DOL and its OIG in detecting fraud. Accordingly, there is significant risk that program oversight will be duplicative or not done. Since October 2008, we have removed 476 claimants based on disability fraud recovered $83.5 million in medical and disability judgments and halted significant future losses. In one of it investigation, a fraudulent claimant received $142,000 in benefits while she was working as a real estate agent and we had pictures of her hiking and bungee jumping. She even bought a boat and named it Free Ride. Other investigations have found fraudulent claimants working as martial arts instructors, landscapers, hairdressers and mechanics. Working with, o with DOL can be difficult. They control needed documents but are often not responsive when we investigate cases. Additionally, they do not take timely action when told that a claimant no longer qualifies for benefits. Even when a claimant is convicted, DOL is slow to terminate benefits. We gave the Department of Labor an investigative report in 2006 which found a claimant was exceeding his limitations. Even though the employee was willing to return to work, the Department of Labor did not reduce his benefits until 2011. Fourteen months ago, we gave Department of Labor an investigative report containing evidence of fraud by a disability claimant, and a subsequent medical exam confirmed the claimant was able to return to work with no restrictions. Despite requests, DOL has taken no action and continues to pay benefits. Over a five-year period, one claimant submitted $190,000 in unsupported mileage reimbursements, and the Department of Labor paid without question. Stress claims in particular are at high risk for fraud. If a doctor sees a correlation between stress and a claimant's work, the claim is often approved. In one instance, a claimant's emotional reaction to a change in work schedule was enough for Department of Labor approval. The OIG also investigates medical providers involved in criminal matters, including disability fraud, and we have recovered $78.5 million since fiscal year 2009. Unfortunately, the Department of Labor provides no standardized billing guidelines for doctors, making it difficult to hold them accountable for fraudulent billings. If the Department of Labor instituted a system similar to Medicare's, prosecutors would be more inclined to take these cases. From our reviews, the Postal Service would benefit from having its own workers' compensation program. Savings would be in the areas of reduced administrative fees, accurate assessment of claims by planned physicians, buyout options, mandatory retirements, immediate access to records, and improved accountability over case management. FECA is in need of significant reform. Such reform could reduce the substantial risk for fraud and improve program efficiency and effectiveness while protecting reasonable benefits for legitimate claimants. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Ms. McManus, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee, I, I believe I am the only um, individual speaking today from the private sector, um, so I feel somewhat at a little bit of a di disadvantage. Nevertheless, uh, let me explain how I even became interested in the FECA. Uh, we manage workers' comp for the non-appropriated funds instrumentalities. And as because of that, we were asked to go down to a, a Navy base in Corpus Christi to assist them in their FECA program. That was in the early uh, 1990s. Since that time, we have been approached by several agencies to assist them. And so we do have contracts with um, some of the Department of Commerce, for example, some FECA agencies, and as such have realized that um, there are so many nuances of the law that, uh, that foster abuse. For example, and uh, not, to, not to be repetitive uh, to both what Mr. Chairman, uh, his opening remarks or, or what's already been said, um, we, we feel that the entire FECA law needs to be sunset and start over and to fashion a new law that would either compare uh, or combine both NAFI workers and fecal uh, appropriated funds workers. Along those lines, reduce the, um, the average weekly wage of 75 percent 
to 66 and two thirds. 75 percent of an average weekly wage tax free lends itself to abuse um, because many times the, the worker actually is making more on workers' comp than if they were working. Uh, another, uh, federal workers who are beyond the retirement age continue to receive workers' comp under the current, under the current scenario. Federal workers would continue to receive 75 percent of their average weekly wage tax free with an annual cost of living increase versus 56 percent under the retirement plan. Again, this scenario lends itself to, to abuse. Um, afford, the, uh, afford appropriated workers the same benefit entitlement as non appropriated workers at the rate of 66 and two thirds. Offer retirement benefits under OWCP to only those employees deemed to be permanently and totally, by legal definition, disabled. Protocols within the Department of Labor for, are far outside industry standards with regard to case management and oversight. For example, in certain situations, a Department of Labor case manager is only required to review a case file every two years. A lot happens in two years. Perhaps change the law to allow a government agency the option of seeking a third party administrator to handle its FECA claims or the Department of Labor. Increase or increase DOL staffing that would ensure proper case management that closely aligns with industry standards. The number of DOL full time equivalents used to administer newly created cases plus the ongoing claims from previous years far exceed standards used in the private sector and industry standards. Many agencies do not even have a centralized program, a key element in managing and man measuring and managing overall performance goals. Implement a requirement that if an agency manages its claims internally, a standard set of protocols and policies as well as standard performance goals and benchmarks must be used. The OIG has performed many audits for various agencies. Most findings indicate ineffective monitoring, a lack of return to work initiatives, ineffective medical management, poor monitoring of chargeback reports, and overall poor performance by the agencies. Agency employees <clears throat> involved in handling or oversight of FECA claims would be required to have some 15 hours or more of continuing education each year covering FECA laws, claims management and benchmarking. Many agencies have no standard return to work program in place for injured workers who may be able to return to the workforce once maximum medical improvement has been achieved. Mandate a program for all agencies to at least attempt to bring workers back to work. Regarding continuation of pay, and that is the first 45 days of uh, disability, um, to my knowledge, there is no other jurisdiction that allows a 45-day continuation of pay uh, where a, an employee receives 100 percent of their salary. Our suggestion would be to eliminate that in its entirety. Thank you, Ms. McManus. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, welcome. I understand you had some transportation delays getting here. We are pleased to have you here. The only thing you missed was the, uh, the swearing in part, so if you don't mind, uh, to stand and uh, raise your right hand and I will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. And again, Mr. Rodriguez, thank you very much for being here. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of the members of AFGE, which represents more than 600,000 Federal employees, including the claims examiners who adjudicate workers' compensation claims, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the proposed changes to the Federal Workers' Compensation Act. We wish we were here offering our views on how to improve the Federal Workers' Compensation Program and how to save the government money. Although the proposed changes are described as modernizing and improving FICA, they basically amount to reducing benefits for injured or ill employees in order to save money. The changes we would like to see are the changes that improve the claims process, the changes that would result in employees getting the medical attention they need sooner, the changes that would give employees the time they need to recover and get well sooner the changes that would ensure that employee agencies meet their FICA responsibilities. Also, the changes that would compel agencies to improve health and safety so workers do not get hurt or become ill in the first place. First, I have some general comments about the proposal. The language in the proposal that implies that injured employees do not want to get back to work is unfortunate. Words like incentivize lead one to believe that employees are injuring themselves so they can be paid by OWCP 
so they don't have to work and eventually retire on workers' compensation benefits. That is an unfair characterization. It does not take into account the diminished work life that many injured employees face. It does not take into account the physical pain employees must endure and the psychological pain they have to deal with when their lives start spiraling into debt because OWCP payments take so long or because their cases are denied. In our experience, most workers wish they had, not get, they had never been hurt. Most want to go back to work when it is safe for them to do so. And most wish they did not have to deal with the workers' compensation process at all. Next, I would like to address some specific changes that are being proposed. The proposal to create an assisted reemployment program seems to be a positive step. However, we are concerned that this program would serve as a disincentive to agencies to make every effort to find suitable jobs for their injured employees. It would potentially create a rush to get the employee into the program, and the worker may be forced to return to work before it is medically advisable. AFGE is also concerned about what happens after the three-year period. For example, a TSA worker is injured and cannot do his TSA job, but he can do a Social Security job. So for three years, he works at SSA and DOL reimburses SSA for his salary. But if he cannot go back to his job at TSA and SSA will not keep him without the subsidy, what alternative does the employee have? We are also concerned about how OWCP will address the needs of workers who do not find employment after the vocational rehabilitation program is completed. We think agencies will use this to get rid of their injured employees. We see this happening already at TSA. AFGE does not believe claimants should be forced to choose between a lower disability retirement than they would have if they had continued to work or having their benefits reduced through the proposed conversion. To make this change more equitable and fair to claimants, the amount of the reduced benefit should be higher than the proposed 50 percent. The proposal would eliminate the increased percentage for claimants with dependents, making the basic compensation rate 70 percent of monthly pay for all claimants. We don't see this as a matter of increasing compensation because a worker has dependents, but of providing injured workers with compensation comparable to what would be their take-home pay before their injury or illness. The proposal would place the three-day waiting period immediately after the employment injury and prior to the 45-day continuation of pay period. So if a worker is injured or made ill on the job, the worker already suffers a loss of income or is forced to use his or her own leave. Other than penalizing employees for becoming sick or injured on the job, we do not see any reason to change the way it is currently done. The proposal to include sanctions for non-cooperation with nurses is too harsh and does not include any due process considerations. In our experience, the primary reason claimants sometimes resist their nurses' intervention is that some nurses exceed their authority by adversely influencing the treating physician's opinions or reports to OWCP. If there are to be sanctions, there needs to be a forum for the claimant to state his or her position and to be heard. In closing, the Federal Workers' Compensation Program should strive to be the best, the model program. It should not be competing with the states in a race to the bottom by lowering benefits to the state's levels. We urge the subcommittee to direct the Office of Workers' Compensation Programs to propose changes that save money by improving the workers' compensation process and not simply by reducing the benefits available to employees injured or made ill by their jobs when they most need them. That concludes my statement. I would be happy to respond to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Ma Rodriguez. We will now move into questions. And I will begin by recognizing the uh, full uh, committee chairman, the distinguished gentleman from California, Chairman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And although your questions will be better trained and more insightful, I will try to get the easy ones out of the way. Ms. Rodriguez, since you, uh, you spoke last, you probably are most freshly in my mind. If I heard you correctly, your your objections are based on mostly abuses or potential abuses. Wouldn't that be a fair characterization of some of the areas that you were saying, including that nurses may not be fair, that uh, employers may dump their employees to another uh, entity of government and so on? Can you show me any example in the private sector where there is a system that looks like the system that you would modify our thoughts to? In other words, where in the private sector would the current system be paralleled? In other words, who treats the private sector? Who, who for example, like the post office, and I don't pick on the post office lightly, but their system allows two 98-year-old uh, people to begin, continue getting full pay uh, years and years after they should have retired. Now, 
Postal workers don't like this any better. It is just part of the legacy system that has thousands who are past retirement age but still not disabled and retired in any way, shape, or form. So are you saying that you like some parts of this uh, uh, proposal? And if so, what part do you like? Well, there are some, some areas that, are, that, are, that would, would be beneficial to employees, um, things like you know, streamlining. And I know that there's, you know, we're all about uh, cutting costs, and I think comparing well, No, we're not necessarily about cutting costs, although we certainly do want to make the system world class. Let me go through a couple of questions. Okay. Do you believe that if someone is unable to do one job but able to do another job, they should be able to do that job during their short or long-term disability? Yes. And we often struggle with agencies to provide okay. those positions for them. Yes. So assuming for a moment that there were a, a neutral third party, mm -hmm. uh, and I am trying to find a yes here, just in case you see I am fishing for it, if there were a neutral third party, they would arbitrate it. In other words, an agency couldn't arbitrarily get rid of somebody, refuse mm -hmm. to take somebody, and for that matter, if you will, the disabled would be fairly uh, allocated to agencies where they could perform the job. If we did that, and I did not say with a subsidy, but if we did that so that the person would be able to go to a part of government which they could still perform, this is very much like our disabled veterans who so often find usable and, and worthwhile jobs in the post office where they get a preference. Mm -hmm. If, in fact, we developed that system and had safeguards so the agencies themselves were not arbitrary, would you approve of a change like that? Yes. That would, I think that would benefit employees. And would it be fair to say that the difference between two jobs could, again, be arbitrated uh, by some sort of a panel that would determine whether or not that change was directly related to their disability and, as such, it should be some supplemental uh, compensation and, obviously, on a yearly basis, monitoring it to see if, as they progressed in their new job, essentially they phased out of that subsidy? Certainly. And I think all, our only concern would be uh, positions that would be medically suitable to the employee. Otherwise, what, what the situation that you are describing would be, would be fine. Okay. But isn't it true that virtually every State in the Union uh, that has workers' comp, State workers' comp, you don't get to choose your doctor to, give him, to get the opinion you want. You, you get, for the most part, assigned to doctors who evaluate your fitness, and they do so as agents of the government, not agents of the injured. Isn't that true? I can only speak to my experience with the Federal Government. I cannot compare with, with the States. I, I, am, I have not worked in workers' compensation with the States, so I, I'm, I cannot answer that. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. Steiner, I think I will go to you. If you are looking at trying to eliminate waste, fraud and abuse, uh, and you are trying to find those very few, and they are few, who ride the system, who uh, you know, have a football accident over the weekend and somehow turn it into an injury that they never work again and they, they, they get all these benefits. We all know there are some of these, as few as there might be. Wouldn't it be true that the government should obviously consider outside opinions contrary to the government's, but shouldn't the government have a medical uh, review board that works on behalf of a fair interpretation of the government, not, not incentivized to take people off disability? but paid to do an evaluation for fitness? Yes, that would certainly eliminate a lot of the potential for fraud by claimants that are trying to abuse a, a good system. Because when they can pick their own doctors, there is the implied ability for them to have a biased opinion right. on their side. And as we are trying to get to a fair and expeditious system, fair to the employee but expeditious to the process, do you believe that the government should act, maybe not everything that Ms. Rodriguez wants to do or doesn't want to do, but do you believe the system, uh, whether it is the post office or other Federal employees, right now needs reform? Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I told you I wouldn't have the best questions, but thank you for letting me have the first. Yield very, back. Very good questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the distinguished gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, again, I, I thank the witnesses for, for helping us with our work. Uh, Mr. Seymour, I was uh, <clears throat> uh, surprised by some of your numbers, uh, especially regarding the, the older employees who, who remain on the retirement, uh, the, the FICA retirement, excuse me, the FICA uh, disability uh, system uh, as opposed to retirement. And I, I want to go back to your numbers. You had, uh, I think it was uh, like, 
4,000 employees over age 80. We had uh, 900 employees I'm sorry. over 80. We had 3,100 employees over the age of 65, and we had 8,700 employees that are over the age of 55. Yeah, I'm taking the later, latter two categories there. Yes, sir. So about 4,000. Is that what you had? 900 and 3,100. Yes, sir. And and those are all over 80 years old. Over 65. O over 65, right? Yes, and then and then it was a smaller group. 900 between actually, 80 and 98. Actually, sir, the 900 is a subset of the 3,100. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So 3,100. So you don't combine them; it's all all one. But yes, still, sir. that's a pretty big number. Yes, sir. Uh, do you, you know? Does the Inspector General track uh, the success rate we have for folks over 80 years old that actually get rehabbed and come back to work? Uh, the Postal Service may have that information. The Inspector General's office does Yeah, that. Yeah, I am just curious because it would seem to me to be a uh, do any of the panelists have any, any indication of how many people who are injured and over 80 actually return to work? We can't tell you over 80, sir. What we can tell you is that um, on average, over 500 individuals are removed from our, our long-term roles on an annual basis. Over the last 10 years, it has been close to 10,000. So there are individuals who move off for a variety of different reasons, sir. Yeah, but, but I am really, really focusing on that. You know, we are trying to devise some reforms here, and if, you know, that would be good information for me to have. We can provide that for the record, sir. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, so. Uh, Mr. Steinberg, you are going to provide that, or is Mr. Seamer going to? We will provide that, sir. We okay. can provide that for the government. Okay. That would be great. So anybody over 80 years old? Yes. Um, maybe you can give me quadrants like 70, 80, 90. Uh, you know, it would just seem to me, look, I am just, you know, I am just looking at this as, as an average person, not as an actuary, but it would seem to me that it would be pretty slim. Uh, chance that someone age 90 or 98 is, is coming back to work uh, after a, an occupational injury. I am just trying to save the government some money here. Uh, so maybe we could, we could take, a, take a whack at that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Seamer, again, I am I, I probably tooting my own horn here. I, uh, I filed legislation along with uh, Ranking Member Cummings. Uh, I introduced to H.R. 1351, the United States Postal Service Retirement Pension Obligation Recalculation and Restoration Act. The title just kind of rolls right off your tongue <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, contained in, in my legislation is a proposal to use a portion. We have got a portion of the postal, U.S. Postal Service's uh, FERS, the Federal Employee Retirement System. We had a surplus of $6.9 billion. And what I try to do, we try to do, is to move some of that money over about 1. Point, I think it's 1.2 billion, to to pay uh, some of the on budget costs of the of the workers' compensation system. Uh, you have any comments on on uh, the wisdom or lack of wisdom that I might have uh, in in trying to trying to do that? Certainly, any move to use that surplus in the FERS uh, retirement system to pay bills that we would otherwise, the Postal Service would otherwise have to pay out of revenue this year is a good thing. So applying it to those normal costs that are occurring this year is a good thing. Thank you. Mr. Steinberg, any, uh, any comment on that? Or? I know, sir. I, I can't speak for the Postal Service and, All right. and the use of their revenues. Okay. I, I realize, and my time is short here, I, I realize we have to do more than just sort of pay as you go. We have got some real reforms here that we have to tackle, and I appreciate that. And, and your help in doing so, but uh, in the meantime, you know, I, I think it's fair, given that that's a surplus owed to the Postal Service, that we 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 pay for some of the costs going forward. Uh, I've got 12 seconds. I'll I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Um, a couple of questions that I've got uh, for lump sum settlement purposes. Uh, federal employees and the federal government cannot settle the exposure in a case, can they, Mr. Steinberg? No, sir. We do not do that at this point in time. And, and, but wouldn't that be a good idea for both sides? In other words, if you knew what your exposure was, and, and, in, and in State workers' compensation programs, for example, allow this, but it would it allow for the injured worker to get on with their life, to be able to have benefits in a lump sum fashion, and then actually have the benefits survive them uh, by way of an annuity? Let me address that from two different perspectives. As I mentioned in my testimony, we do propose a lump sum payment for a, a, a scheduled award. And again, that is associated with a 
a, a permanent functional disability, and there is that form of compensation. That can serve as, a, if you will, an investment for retirement for an individual who may have a lifetime disability. In terms of a lump sum payment associated with the wage loss, we believe that that should be a continued payment. Um, we continue to hope that individuals will return to work. And as we continue to provide the wage loss um, supplement, we can work with them in terms of, of vocal, vocational rehabilitation, looking for opportunities for them to come back either to their original job or to other jobs, preferably within the Federal, the federal Government. We believe that is the most prudent approach. It allows us to maintain a relationship with them as they continue to go through, if you will, a recovery stage. Thank you. Ms. Rodriguez, would you agree that, 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 that an employee should have the option of whether they want to lump sum settle a permanent total disability case? Thank you. Um, yes, if they have that option, and I think um, in the way that Mr. Steinberg has, um, has described it, I would agree with that. Good. Thank you. Uh, with regard to third party recoveries, in a case where uh, third party action has caused the injury, which is compensable under the Federal Employees Compensation Act, uh, there is no recovery, is there? There are no lien rights for the Federal Government against a third party tort fees, or is there? At this point, that is one of the things that we are asking for. Good. Um, Good. And, 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 and in, in, in any such fashion, I mean, do you have any ideas, I mean, uh, percentage-wise, or, or just, just look at lien rights? We think it is going to be relatively small, but we can provide additional information for that, on that for you, sir. Thank you. And, Mr. Steinberg, with regard to medical, because medical drives these cases. As we know, that the medical opinions are what dictates what type of disability uh, a person may have. Uh, and, and if somebody goes to their physician and their physician takes the case and continues to treat them, are there any medical fee reimbursement schedules that, or, or do you pay usual and customary, or what does the Federal Government pay in terms of medical? We pay based on the AMA codes. Um, we, we have the codes. That's, that's, by, that's what we follow. Um, we monitor that, obviously, in terms of our central bill pay processing to ensure that the, um, the bills are at the proper level. We also look for situations where they may be over or there may be an issue. Um, so as the, uh, the Postal Service IG has suggested, um, we do monitor that. We do monitor that closely, and we contact the IGs if we see that there are issues associated with payments, sir. And is the AMA fee reimbursement, is that, how does that compare to Medicare reimbursement? Do you know? Is that less or more? Or Mr. Fitzgerald? Uh, yes, we have a medical fee schedule that is tied to the Medicare uh, uh, payment uh, fee schedule, and on average it is about a 5 percent over that, the Medicaid fee schedule in order to attract uh, more physicians to the program. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, let, let me make sure I understand the, 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 the legal um, classifications of benefits. I guess you've got, you have temporary total disability benefits, temporary partial disability benefits, and once maximum medical improvement is reached, then you have either wage loss or permanent total disability. What is the legal definition of permanent total disability? It is the inability to perform any work, um, and particularly work that was associated with the date of injury job. But if there is no ability to perform any work as determined by medical evaluation, and verification, then that is total disability. It is an economic construct. Sir. So, so if, if there is no work available within a geographic area, uh, does that constitute permanent total disability benefits? No, it does not. So, so it has to be, it is it, it, not uninterrupted light duty work, it is just no work at all? No, what I am trying to try to say is that work is, uh, work, the ability to work is the determining factor whether or not compensation is paid not the availability of a job. If someone has a wage earning capacity, we will not, re, we will not pay benefits to them for and, that. And how is that determined? Is it through vocational rehabilitation testimony as to whether they have wage earning capacity? It is an evaluation done by uh, uh, medical professionals and voc rehab specialists. Okay. With regard to fraud? In, in, excuse me, in conjunction with our, our claims examiners. Okay. Mr. Simmer, you talked about in your testimony about somebody bungee jumping and doing all this. And uh, Is there any adjudication process that can determine whether somebody has committed fraud in the receipt of workers' compensation benefits? We, uh, anytime we investigate a, a claimant that appears to be defrauding the system, we present that to a prosecutor for prosecution. Um, we count on feedback from the Department of Labor if they encounter fraud, but we have never received a referral and, from them. And one last question, because I am a little bit over my time here. Um, if there is a determination or adjudication of fraud and they are found guilty, does that in any way affect the receipt of workers' compensation benefits? Yes. If they are if they're convicted of FECA fraud or health care fraud related to their current injury, that the, the benefits for that injury are immediately terminated. However, that conviction does not prevent them from claiming a new injury in the future if they continue to be an employee. Thank you very much. My time has expired. I will recognize uh, the distinguished gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if I can just pick up on that last thing, Mr. Is it Seimer or Seamer? Seamer, sir. Seamer. Thank you. Um, you mean somebody convicted of fraud would still be on the Federal payroll? If they remain an employee. I, I, no, no. That is what I am asking. Somebody convicted of fraud can still remain a Federal employee? Yes. How is that possible? Um, we have instances where um, some of the employees, not for uh, medical fraud, have been convicted or pled guilty in court, and uh, through arbitration at the Postal Service, they have gotten their old job back. So they don't go to jail? No, that person did not that I am thinking of. Right. But I mean, that is up to the courts, not the Postal Service or the Department of Labor. About whether they go to jail? If they are convicted of fraud in a court of law, it is up to the court to decide their, their sentence. Yes. Not the Federal agency. Correct. Okay. I just want to be clear about that. Um, uh, Mr. Steinberg, do I understand that uh, for the Federal Employee Compensation Act, overhead is just 4 percent of benefits? Overhead is actually 5 percent, sir. 5 percent. And has remained at the level um, for years. And Federal workers' compensation costs are 1.8 percent of total Federal and postal payrolls? I believe so, yes. And that compares to 2.3 percent for private insurance and State funds? I can't speak to the private sector or, or the State funds, sir. Well, I am actually reading, I think, from your website. Um, do I also understand, I mean, but if that were true, that would compare favorably? Yes, sir. And do I also understand that we actually save some money because uh, uh, disputes of claims are resolved administratively rather than through litigation? Is that correct? We think that is the hallmark of the system. It is a non-adversarial system. Um, we, we are unbiased. We are looking at the situation. We are, require, we are, are required to review medical evidence. That is the basis for our adjudication. It is important to point out that 85 percent of the claims that we receive, we accept. 15 percent of the claims we do reject. And those are, those are right. cases where we determine so, not it is not a work related But the issue. point is, we save taxpayers a lot of money by avoiding litigation in the system. Yes, sir, we do. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Seamer, uh, you talked, and, and Ms. McManus, I want to come to you as well. In fact, let me start with you, Ms. McManus. If I understood your testimony, you called for the complete sunset of the program on two bases. One was that somebody might actually, uh, in compensation, get more money than they would otherwise get in, for example, a pension situation, and therefore we were rewarding people for being injured. And secondly, uh, secondly somebody might game the system, commit fraud. Is that correct? Partially, um, sir. That is not the only reason we would recommend sunsetting the FECA law. Those are just a few examples. Okay. L let, me ask you, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> um, do people game private insurance? For example, do, do, do people game uh, uh, building insurance or auto insurance? I think it is safe to say yes. Do you think those two systems, for example, ought to be completely sunsetted and we all start over again to, to, to create some new insurance system that somehow avoids that? No, sir. So why would we do it for FECA, other than it happens to be a Federal program? Well, by comparison to other workers' compensation laws, and if, if you look at sheer numbers, um, it is it's vastly greater than any other comparable workers' compensation law as far as the benefit entitlement. So, but why not reform it? I mean, there are lots of reforms on the table. The administration has one. Susan Collins in the Senate has one. We have several here. That would be a great alternative. Okay. Rather than, that's all I was trying to get at. Sunsetting the entire program is a fairly draconian measure. All right. And I have 53 seconds left. Mr. Seamer, uh, you gave us an example of somebody who named her boat obviously uh, apparently successfully having gamed the system. And while that is uh, certainly a juicy tidbit, um, hopefully you didn't mean to suggest that that characterized, that that gaming characterized the whole system and that everybody was sort of gaming. You meant to illustrate how it could be abused in the extreme. That is exactly correct. And, and you would agree that you know, abuse of, of, a, of a system, compensation system such as this, is not limited to the Federal Government. It also occurs in the private sector. I would imagine so. Is there any reason to believe that it's more, uh, that it occurs more often in this program than it does, in fact, in the private sector? I have no idea, sir. Thank you. My time is up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Connolly. And now I recognize the uh, Vice Chair of the Subcommittee, the distinguished gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Amash. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Steinberg, the President's Commission on the Postal Service argued the Postal Service should be given uh, relief from the provisions of FECA that create costly unintended consequences. Do you agree, and why or why not? I believe that we should work closely with the Postal Service to address the requirements of the program. Um, I believe we have an opportunity to work in partnership to address many of the issues that were discussed today. Um, I think we, we share in a responsibility to help their injured workers re return to work and to provide wage loss um, compensation while they are injured. What is the level of overpayment in FECA? Uh, improper payments? Yeah. Point one percent. Yeah. How much? 0.1 percent. 0.1 percent. As measured by our Office of Chief Financial Officer for the past several years. Uh, would the conversion from FECA to retirement allow broader survivor benefits? The, the conversion to, um, if you will, from, from FECA to, to, fur, or to FERS, for example, um, would, would not ex expand the, the survivor's benefits. Um, it would create some challenges. Um, between us and, and obviously the Office of Personnel Management. Um, that is why we suggest the conversion to a 50 percent level, which more closely relates to the retirement benefits from OPM. Uh, your testimony, Mr. Steinberg, states that uh, less than 2 percent of all new injury cases remain on the periodic roll two years after the date of injury. How does this compare to the private sector and State programs? Uh, that is something that we will research for you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, what percentage of time does OCWP uh, staff, do, uh, OWCP staff, devote to the management of new FECA disability claims or cases versus screening long-term disability cases, and is it an appropriate mix? We we have evolved that over time. Um, when the program began, there was a major focus on review, adjudication, the payment. Um, over the last many years, as I talked about, we have been able to impact the return to work rate significantly, and that is because we have applied a more balanced approach to dealing with the front end of the process, but also the return to work. And we have made significant improvements in that arena, sir. In um, Mrs. Rodriguez's written testimony, she indicates that many Federal employees are going into debt due to DOL rejecting a claim or taking too long to process it. Do you have statistics on the 15 percent of claims that are rejected in a given year? Sir, if you could clarify the nature, the, the 15 percent, those are claims that we have reviewed have been determined to be non-work related injuries, and we, we gain that through the evidence and through the discussions with the claimant themselves. So it's, is it a fair accusation that the accepted claims are not processed in a timely manner? No, I believe that the accepted claims are processed in a, in a timely manner. Um, we can submit for the record data that shows the, the timeliness associated with, with our claim submission. On average, um, the, the, the average claim is processed within 16 days. Um, Ninety-four percent of our, of our claims are processed within one month. These beat the standards that, that we have established with OMB, yet we will continue to try to push to lower those numbers. Thank you. And if you could submit the information on the timeliness, we would appreciate that. Um, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, do you think it is appropriate that some Federal employees continue to receive FECA benefits well past retirement age, in some cases at the age of 98? Keep forgetting that. Um, I think there is room for some improvement in that area. Certainly, you know, people who would retire normally. I just think our our, our basic concern here is making things more equitable and not um, having the worker suffer a loss if they would have continued to work. And so, something that is more equitable to what they would have been receiving in retirement would be acceptable. Um, and I know some of the proposals have you know have looked at what OPM would do. Um, we think 50 percent is is not the right amount. Uh, people who continue to work that would have access to higher th uh, their higher three average salaries would, would be higher than when they stopped working. Uh, they would have had the opportunity to contribute to their thrift savings programs. Um, things like that that, would, that other people who are not injured would have access to. Uh, we don't want to shortchange the people who did get hurt and were not able to continue to make those contributions into retirement. And you, you offered several suggestions in your written testimony on how to improve DOL's uh, FECA reform proposal. Do you have any uh, cost estimates on your uh, reforms? No, I do not. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Th thank you. We have been called to vote. We have got 11 minutes and 30 seconds for two questioners, and I will recognize the distinguished gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for five minutes. All right. Very, quick. very quickly, um, I, I, was, uh, I have a question. Uh, I guess it would be for Mr. Seymour. 
uh, for the IG report. Um, I, I always find the, the um, examples anecdotally uh, striking, uh, but they immediately raise new questions for me. How typical and what does the data show? For example, most of the uh, um, cases of the kind, $142,000 lady uh, who was working as a real estate agent and was caught bun <laughs> uh, bungee jumping, most of those cases, frankly, I read about in, state, in, in the States, you know, that a cop, for example, who has been off duty for two years and is out hiking or doing something worse. Most, you know, the ones who make the newspaper, in other words, I have seen these a lot. So my first question is, uh, really goes to uh, uh, how bad the system really uh, is. You say uh, we have removed 476 claimants based on disability fraud. Out of how many? We investigated, uh, since the beginning of fiscal year 2009, we have investigated two, a little over 2,000 allegations that claimants were defrauding the system. So this is in, in 2008 alone? Uh, since uh, the, the beginning of fiscal year 2009, so October 1, 2008 to I'm present, so two and a half years. So uh, uh, you would call that high in relation, for example, to the States or to the private sector? I have no idea how that data compares. I, 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 I'm having a hard time understanding what would be a fair number, frankly. Uh, if, if you are a member of the public, any number looks awful. Uh, but I can't tell unless I compare it with something. Mr. Steinberg, do you have any, com any, any, any I, at least comparative? I certainly do, ma'am. Um, if, you, if you put it into perspective, we receive 130,000 cases a year. Um, based on, on our information and our discussions with our IG, there are less than 100 convictions per year. So it is a very minute portion of the percent. Those are prosecu prosecutions. So are you in touch with that data, Mr. Singer? No, I, I, I'm not certain how that data compares to the, the universe of cases we've investigated. However, how, uh, how was your universe chosen? Uh, just from the cases that we worked. So it was random. No, it was the the healthcare fraud cases we worked over the last two and a half years. In that body of work, 116 of those employees were arrested, and a subset of those were were. So you chose those because those were really problematic. That uh, that 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 category. Well, it was just pertained to the testimony. I brought in the, the universe of work that seemed But it, that is, <laughs> that is by, by all measures, uh, uh, a particularly problematic uh, category of? We, um, we investigate allegations for a variety of reasons. Clearly, it is a very small subset of the total number of legitimate Well, uh, Mr. Stein, what do you think of Mr. Steinberg's number? Um, the, the, the relative number of convictions, I don't think, has a direct bearing on how many people are getting benefits and shouldn't be. Well, how many people are getting benefits that shouldn't be of those 130,000? Well, a quarter of the people that we investigated were removed or retired or so resigned. So you are saying a quarter of, of the people? That we investigated. Uh, well, <laughs> but obviously that isn't my question. Uh, you, investiga you investigated a, a particular slice, and uh, we are being told the program needs a complete overhaul. Uh, <laughs> therefore, uh, it is fair to ask, how typical is your slice of the program? Well, we, I believe, represent half of all of the, the, the benefits that are paid out through the OWCP program in the Postal Service. And this past year we had 15,000 people, 800 on, on the long-term periodic roles. In a given year it looks like we have 200 people that are removed from those roles. So that is the percentage that, that we now, see. Now, considering, Mr. Mr. Steinberg, that we are talking also about federal employees, and there is a recommendation uh, that the uh, Postal Service ought to be separated out. Does the whole panel think the Postal Service ought to be separated out? Uh, no, no ma'am. We believe that. We don't think so. We believe that we have the skills, the experience, the capabilities to do this. Um, we have individuals who are trained. This is, this is our core mission. Um, we don't believe that that is the core mission of the Postal Service. As I indicated earlier, we are looking forward to working with the Postal Service to try to address their issues and to improve the program. Well, is Mr. Mr. Simer's uh, uh, data reflect uh, uh, accurately on the full, the full complement of uh, uh, disabilities that you look at? Claimants you look at? Well, uh, again, as, as um, pointed out, the Postal Service is 40 percent of our customer base. Um, I think, as you have suggested, by looking at the numbers, there is a, a, a very small cadre of individuals who commit fraud 
and I think have suggested an even smaller group of individuals who are ultimately convicted of fraud. We found this, I, I oversaw the program for a number of years at the Department of Veterans Affairs, and we found very similar type of information where we had over 15,000 individuals who were on the roll. When we did a complete review, we found that less than half of 1 percent were individuals that we referred to the IG. So it was a very small number. Um, and Thank you, Mr. Steinberg. I am afraid the time has expired. And I will recognize the uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Steinberg, uh, the AFGE's testimony focused a great deal on problems that individuals have with agency processing of claims. Um, obviously, this is a big source of consternation. Do you, know, do you think that the agencies could improve uh, the time that, that, that it often takes to get a claim processed so that individuals know the result and they can get back to work? Or? Mr. Davis, that is an excellent question. Um, and I can speak to my experience overseeing the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, I believe Mr. Lynch referred to the IG study of, of, 19, of, of 2005, and there were a number of issues that were identified. We did a, a major planning exercise and a major transformational activity that focused on improving our process. One of the key elements of that was improving communication between the agency and the Department of Labor. We set, it, we set up quarterly review meetings where we would talk about cases. We would focus on particular problem cases. This significantly helped Im improve the, the processing and, and improve the situation. We also did extensive training within the Department of Veterans Affairs to educate both the employee and the supervisors in terms of the process, and we also changed the culture in terms of return to work. One of the reasons that I was so honored to join the Department of Veterans Affairs is to take those types of success stories and share those with other departments and agencies, and I am committed to doing that, sir. Thank you. I, I represent an area that has a large number of postal workers. I come from Chicago, Cook County, 5.5 million people, almost a lot of postal workers. And there seem to be a great deal of controversy surrounding what qualifies for a duty change where physical uh, requirements have had to be met relative to the acquisition of the job. Uh, are we making headway in determining uh, what really constitutes the, the ability to move from one level of one piece of work to another as a result of injury or, or, or something comparable? I am prepared to address the, the positive aspect of that. Over the years, we have worked very closely with the Postal Service to monitor the status of their employees as they go through rehabilitation and to look for opportunities for either full-time placement or light-duty positions. And over the years, we have been successful in that. Um, we hope to continue to have that type of focus. And again, that is a partnership, as I indicated earlier, between the, the Department, DOL, the claimant, and their physician. And we all work together in partnership to try to look for the right opportunities. So we, we have experienced success in the past. Anyone else have any, any thoughts about that? I would only add, sir, that uh, I think an area that remains an opportunity is uh, making that claims examination process or that, that feedback by DOL and, and managing the case towards a point where a limited duty offer can be presented can certainly be um, uh, enhanced or improved. Well, thank Go ahead, please. Uh, I just wanted to add that part of the uh, proposals we put forward includes a provision called assisted reemployment, which would help uh, Postal Service workers in particular, we think, because it basically uses the compensation payments they are receiving to help subsidize employment within Federal agencies. So uh, we just think that is another alternative to be, be looked at in this process. Well, I hope we would continue because many of the individuals are often told that there is no light duty in their environment, or that there is nothing else that can be done. And, of course, it frustrates them. It frustrates me because I don't know what to tell them <laughs> once they get beyond that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And uh, I would like to thank our witnesses for testifying today. Um, Mr. Lynch did have another question, but he's going to submit that in writing. There being no further business, the committee will stand adjourned. Thank you.